So Pokemon Scarlet and Violet are out, and what better way for me to celebrate than by trying to make the games impossibly hard? On my first playthrough, classic hardcore Nuzlocke rules, pause now to read them, aren't gonna cut it for an unmodded game though, I crave a bit more of a challenge. So, just like I did in Pokemon Brilliant Diamond, I'll be resetting my game immediately as soon as only one of my Pokemon faints. I'm not kidding, here's a clip of Attempt 2 in which I find a wild pink urchin encounter, underestimate its attack, and lose my skip bloom. I immediately proceed to delete my save data and start the game over. In this run, you'll be seeing the painful ways this game forced me to replay its tutorial over and over, as well as what I believe to be the most broken starter in Nuzlocke history, what strategy I used to take on the Elite Four and Champion in this game with a team of only two Pokemon, and me pushing this game to its absolute limits on my very first playthrough. I'm Pokemon Challenges, I'm probably the best Nuzlocker in the world, and this is the Pokemon Violet Deathless Hardcore Nuzlocke. I begin attempt one and realize that Game Freak removed set mode? Cool. Guess we'll be mashing B every time I kill an enemy Pokemon. It's fine. This is only like the fifth time that Game Freak's done like a small thing like this. Just a few, few middle fingers. Anyway, I pick Quaxly because like no matter how much Game Freak fucks up, their character design team is just, they just can't miss, okay? Quaxly is so, it's so cute. My first encounter here is Lechonk and, uh, okay, okay, hold on. Let's slow down for one last time, I'm sorry. How do you even determine your first encounter in this game? In previous games, this was easy. You would simply walk into grass and receive a randomly rolled Pokemon. The whole challenge in Nuzlocke was that you had to adapt to the encounters the game randomly gave you. Now, they're all running around, in the open! At first, I tried to just close my eyes and run into them, but with the game having set spawn locations for each Pokemon that felt not random enough. So what I started doing eventually was getting a list of every Pokemon that spawned in any given area and spinning a wheel. This has the added benefit that the wheel sometimes lands on a rare Pokemon that I then have to go hunt for, which seems a little closer to the intended game experience, I guess. After mashing past two hours of cutscenes, getting my first few encounters, and playing that copy of Rocket League that I ordered on Wish, I quickly figure out a workup into wing attack setup with Quaxley to sweep Katie and get my first gym badge. I now head through this town, whose major landmark was very clearly animated by the company that made the highest grossing media franchise in history, to face Brassius. I set up spikes to break his ace suitable to sturdy, but completely underestimate this Pokemon's bulk. Even with Sharp Beak and Workup, Quaxwell cannot kill here, and man are my other encounters dog water. I unfortunately have no outs and have to take my first death, and with it, a reset all the way to the intro cinematic. Seriously, this pseudowoodo is a menace. Grass Rock is actually a really vicious combination. Every type that can hit the grass type pseudo super effectively gets killed by Stab Rock Throw. This is a super well designed fight. At this point, I'm feeling like this game is extremely hard. I even make a Twitter post about it, and people in chat are telling me that the late game gets even harder. Sounds like I'm in for a treat. Attempt 2 actually makes it all the way past Iono, but as you saw, dies to a random wild Pincurchin encounter because I wasn't properly leveled within my level cap. That's just about 10 hours down the drain, it's no big deal. Okay. Attempt 3 Katie. I have no idea what came over me, but I somehow made three sloppy mistakes building this team. One, Fuokoko is not holding the charcoal it's supposed to be holding, which leads to me missing the kill range on Teddy Ursa. Two, this Mareep isn't evolved, despite being at evolution level. Three, this Shinx is also not evolved. A Pokemon that were evolved could easily switch into Katie's Teddy Ursa for a kill. My only out is to go for a bite flinch, which I do not get. This wipe was definitely deserved. Even the best Nuzlocke in the world has an off day sometimes, okay? By attempt 4, I finally figure out that if played correctly, Fuakoko basically sweeps the first two gems on his own. Bronzor, another very important encounter, helps him out here. Steel types do extremely well into the Sudowoodo, and I rolled one of the only early game ones. But damn, this fire starter is pretty good early game. I'm sure it's balanced by falling off in the late game, right? I'm currently foreshadowing. And now I'm lampshading. And now I'm laying this joke over Stade's well. Before facing Iono, I spin the wheel for my East 2 encounter and find out that somehow this area has... Mimikyu. Just chilling in the ruins. Yeah, this thing is my encounter. Let me help you understand why Mimikyu is so good in Nuzlocke with the help of today's sponsor, NordVPN. The most important thing in Mimikyu's kit is its disguise ability, which will protect it from the first move that the opponent uses on it. Much like NordVPN can protect you by disguising... Eh? 
Eh? By disguising your online activity when you're using public Wi-Fi network. Mimic can, can therefore always get an attack off safely if you can switch it in with its disguise ability up. It, it can do so because it's also protected by its three immunities. So if you can find a way to switch Mimikyu into one of those, you can always get a free move off thanks to disguise. Mimikyu is protected by its immunities, kind of like how you're protected by NordVPN's anti-malware feature, Threat Protection. This is a huge upgrade for NordVPN, and it's the next step in protecting you as the user. It protects you from intrusive ads and trackers. If you're downloading a file, threat protection will automatically scan it for malware. NordVPN is no longer just a VPN, it's also a powerful cybersecurity tool for you. Much like the moves that Mimikyu gets are quite powerful, it gets Woodhammer extremely early in this game. Um, it can use Shadow Sneak for a priority kill on something if you can switch it in with Disguise. It's a fantastic Pokemon for Nuzlocke, and it's really, really fun to use. And NordVPN can make the internet more fun to use for you by allowing you to access shows and movies on your favorite streaming sites that aren't available in your country normally. NordVPN has a 30-day money-back guarantee if you aren't happy. They have 24-7 customer support if something isn't working. Go to nordvpn.com slash Pokemon Challenges. The link is also down in the description. Or use code Pokemon Challenges at checkout. Thank you so much for Nord for sponsoring this video, and I hope you guys enjoy it. Iono is another really well-designed fight. Hermes Magius has Levitate and transforms into an Electro-type, making it have no weaknesses. I actually had to figure out a pretty clever setup here to ensure a clean kill on it. I know that the AI will always send out the Ace last. Knowing this, I can use her weak Luxio to set up a situation in which Mimikyu can come out against Miss Magius with its disguise still up. Remember, I'm not using Switch Mode. I use Knacklestack's Salt Cure on Luxio to do continuous damage every turn. I then time my switches perfectly so that Crocolor can come in and yawn. Luxio now falls asleep and is guaranteed to sleep on the last turn that Salt Cure leaves it alive. I can use this turn to get a safe switch in for Mimikyu. Now, was I really proud of this setup on stream only then to realize I forgot to give Mimikyu a Persenberry to deal with Confuse Ray? And did Mimikyu then hit itself, breaking its own disguise? Yeah. Yeah, I did, but it was a really cool setup, okay? Luckily, I had a contingency plan with Oinkaloon, who can swap into a Hex and is bulky enough to tank hits from his Magius. With the additional damage from Normal-type Terra, it can two-shot the X ghost type and get us a third Gym Badge. Something weird happens in this game at this point. All of the Gym Leader fights have been really well designed around their Terra Pokémon so far, but after Gym 3, it feels like... Game Freak kind of gave up, or probably ran out of time. Combine that with us getting a lot more encounters and reaching critical mass to where we can cover a ton of options, the fights here sort of get a lot easier. Like, this Wug Trio set in Gym 4 is just so trash. Is it just me? The Crabominable is still kind of a threat, to be fair. I can, however, get Mimikyu in with Disguise up again by switching the Cloister, who will always bait a Fighting-type move from Kofu's Ace. Mimikyu can then come in on the Fighting-type move, which it is immune to, and have Disguise still up. Woodhammer can get a completely safe and clean kill, and win us our fourth Gym Badge. Larry's Gym Puzzle and Writing make him my second favorite Gym Leader in the game, but his team is, again, extremely underwhelming. Miss Magius with Levitate completely walls his Dunsparce, or Bronzong, or, well, any Rock or Seal type walls his Staraptor, and whatever his other Pokémon was was so insignificant that I already have forgotten what it was and cannot be bothered to look it up. And my friends, this is where the Run Star is revealed. Enter Skeledurge. Oh boy, this thing is busted. Skeledurge's signature move in this game is Torch Song. It's a Fire-type move that boosts special attack whenever used. How much base damage would a balanced version of this move have? 40? Hey, maybe 60. Charge Beam has 60, right? Charge Beam was only 50% to raise special attack and it wasn't perfectly accurate like Torch Song, but it's a signature move, it's balanced by its distribution, right? Torch Song is 80 base power. It's basically almost a flamethrower. After using it once, it becomes a Fire Blast in terms of power. Torch Song is also a sound-based move, so you can use it in combination with Throat Spray to get a plus 2 boost on its first use. In addition to that, Skeledurge has pretty crazy bulk and has a secondary ghost typing for stab shadow balls as well as the handy immunities and resistances that come with it. If you're ever threatened by dark or other ghost type moves, you can simply click Terrestrialize, keep your ghost stab, and get rid of its weaknesses. Oh, and also give an additional one-third boost in power to your completely busted Torch Songs. Does this Pokémon have no downsides? Well, it has one. Its speed is very mediocre, a pretty important stat for a sweeper. The issue, however, is that this game grants you every tool possible to mitigate this. The Choice Scarf is already available for you to buy after you beat Larry and unlock Crocolore's evolution via the next level cap. Additionally, you get the power items for EV grinding extremely early, as well as unlocking bottle caps to max out your IVs, and mints to change your nature after Gym 6. 
a Max EV, IV, and Plus Speed Nature Skeledurge can be obtained within about 30 minutes after getting the 6th badge. Because enemies don't have speed EVs in this game, Skeledurge's one weakness is completely eliminated. Gym 6 is a double battle and has this interesting mechanic where you and the gym leader can get buffs from the crowd. You get offensive boosts for killing a Pokemon and omni boosts for terrestrializing. You can stack these in your favor extremely quickly, however. Ryan will only terrestrialize her last Pokemon and the boost doesn't come in until the end of the turn, so by the time she makes any use of the gimmick, you've already stacked Skeledurge to max special attack and are annihilating her team. Mabostiff and Bronzong give us an easy time in Tulip Psychic Gym and the trend of the gyms not really having good coverage continues. Also, wow, this gym puzzle is shit. I will say, the Bronzong encounter is really nice here. That Forges is probably a threat otherwise. Gym 8 is more of the same. Skeletor just sweeps by clicking Torch Song and holy fucking femboy, I did not think a Pokemon game would make me feel this bisexual. After clicking the extremely repetitive, but honestly really cute Team Star storyline. Seriously, how is every character in this plotline an LGBTQ icon? And defeating the rest of the Titans, it was time for the Elite Four. The madness does not end though. At this point in the run, I am bloodthirsty. Planning for the Pokemon League, I spot something incredible. Doesn't Scarf, Croc, sweep like most of this? I feel like... Chat. I feel like we should be able to set up a Cloister sweep. Wait, two Pokemon Elite Four? White Herb Shell Smash Cloister sweeps three Elite Four members here. Skeledurge sweeps the remaining one, Poppy. Whose ace Pokemon curiously looks exactly like a character from League of Legends. Who is also named Poppy. Wait, Cassiopeia? LP? No, no, the rift is calling. No, I can't. Let me go, please, please, I have to finish the script. No, I have to finish this video, please let me- Drunk on my own hubris, I challenge the champion Gita, still with only two Pokemon in my party. I go for the Thread Spray Torch Song and realize I've made a huge mistake. Espathra has a new ability called Opportunist, and using it, it just copied my plus two special attack. I am in crit range. I'll be honest, this was incredibly careless and probably should have cost me the fight, but I'm still in huge trouble. Gita's Veluza has Aqua Jet. I run the calculations to see if my run is over and... Chat! Max roll Aqua Jet! 62. He didn't go for it. Er macht's nochmal spannend am Ende! Nice. It's unbelievable and a little bit unfair how lucky I got here. I complete the sweep with Skeledurge and Blaze and earn my champion title. The last part of the game is, unfortunately, still extremely easy. The only team that has some sizable threats is the final battle with Nimona and the very last battle of the game. But at least for Nimona, I just have access to too many broken tools at this point. A Heracross I caught in the northern province and then EV trained outspeeds and one-shots Nimona's entire team. The dude with the Futurama dog has a bit of a joke of a team, but I do appreciate that all of his Pokemon except the dog are food themed. Penny is legit just evolutions with quick attack. And Clavel gets, you guessed it, swept by Skeledurge. Okay, I'm not gonna lie. I'm a huge cynic, but this next part of the game is actually insanely cool. It's by far the most well-executed final section of any Pokemon game ever made. And that's mostly in thanks to the absolutely phenomenal writing throughout the game. Both the original writers and the localization team blew all of my expectations for a Pokemon game out of the water. This section is so well written that I'm going to give you something I normally super don't give a fuck about, a spoiler warning. If you haven't yet played the game and you feel like you might enjoy it, it might benefit you to tune out now and go play it yourself. The buggy, laggy, and incredibly ugly disaster of a game that comes before this section almost, almost makes this worth it. Alright, they're gone guys. Jesus, this game looks like shit. Seriously, look at this grass texture in the crater. Is this Banjo-Kazooie? What the uh -huh. fuck is going on? Am I losing my mind? Do you guys really think this is acceptable? This section would have been the coolest shit in any Pokemon game ever if the developers had actually been able to optimize their game for the console they were hired to make it for. Jesus! Anyway, the writing is really cool. This is an amazing idea for a final battle, the AI that goes rogue. It's so interesting because this is the first Pokemon game ever that has no villains. Anyway, more on that in my full review of the game, coming soon. Tura leads with a Pokemon four times weak to Skeletor's Earth Power, and I immediately get a one-hit KO. 
The reason I'm leaving Skeletors here is because I actually know how the switch in AI works already. It's the same one they've been using since Gen 5. AI simply looks at which of its Pokémon has the highest base power moves. It considers type effectiveness, but not stab. Iron Barb's Earthquake and Stone Edge are the most damage for Skeledurge here, and it gets sent in next, scoring me a clean double kill with a second Earth power on a 4 times weak Pokémon. Next up is Iron Dragulus, and holy shit, why have I been streaming for 22 hours at this point? Anyway, Thick Fat Azumarill with an Assault Vest can 1v1 this, and the Rogue AI wants me to catch these Iron Hands next. Among Us resists the Electric Fighting Stab, however, and can send the Imposter all the way to Med Bay with a Degenerate Toxic Strat. Iron Bundle has my entire team on its naughty list, but Ampharos will come in to be our Grinch and zap Santa Claus back into non-existence. For this final turn, Turo plays Polymerization, sending Gardevoir and Gallade from his hand to the graveyard, and special summoning Iron Valiant from his extra deck. But as was so often the case in this run, Bronzong can tank this monster of a Pokémon. Unfortunately, the second Heavy Slam leaves Turo's ace alive with a sliver of health, but we can avoid the final crit chance of a game by switching to Mimikyu and checkmating with Shadow Sneak. No death, Hardcore Nuzlocke. Oh! And that was the deathless Hardcore Nuzlocke of Pokemon Violet. Honestly, I think this run actually has the potential to be really interesting if you were to ban EVs, Nature Mints, Bottle Caps, Setup Moves, the Fuacoco line, Annihilate, Palafin, Early Game Flamigo, Terrestrializing, and using the bathroom for the entire duration of the run. Maybe give it a try with those rules and let me know how you did. Anyway, uh, Ed Sheeran is a talentless hack that has done irreparable damage to pop music forever. This game plays like a pre-alpha release, almost all the new Pokémon are amazing, and the nickname theme this run was Things Not To Put Up Your Butt, so go back through the video and tell me in the comments which nickname was your favorite.